now that you're here with me I want to keep you free Ladies and gentlemen, is loving you, but now the day has come. gentlemen and ladies, you know where I'm from, yeah. ladies and gents, we're going to have Al playing in our background, going to do a little bit of Isley's, then a little bit of Erica, then a little bit more of Al, so just want y'all to hold on and hang on. There are a couple of things that we need to explain to people because they don't understand the system. So the first thing that you need to know is that many of you have been doing things that you knew for sure was supposed to work, but then in the long run it didn't work and they pretty much shot you down and they said things like, that was bull crap, this is that that junk and they they everybody's doing this stuff and we've already said you can't do it. Excuse me? We already said you can't do it. What do you mean you already said I can't do it? <laughs> Who are you? Uh-uh, the law needs to say I can't do it. Does, is there a law, am I breaking the law? Then shut up. The contracts that are being written as we've explained before, they're what's known as unilateral contracts. What's a unilateral contract? Well, a unilateral contract is based on a concept of contract law. This is stuff that's developed for centuries, millennia. Well, what's a unilateral contract? Well, it's where two parties have a relationship with each other. And let's say party A says to party B, or Bob and Jim, have a relationship and Jim says to Bob hey Bob uh, you want me to go ahead and take care of that for you Jim says take care of what oh to go ahead and just move that pile of bricks over there because you need it done you, you said you got to get it done by Friday Bob I'll take care of that for you okay and Jim says all right sure and so Bob takes care of it and Bob comes back to Jim and says hey Jim you owe me sixty thousand dollars Jim says, what I owe you $60,000 for? Bob says, because I moved them bricks for you. Jim says, you just moved bricks. You didn't move the entire nation. Mm, Jim is upset. But wait a minute. Bob says, but Bob, Bob, you got to go tell Jim that you guys got a contract. So Bob goes over to Jim. and say, Jim, I was saying to myself, I said, hey, Bob, you got to go tell Jim you got a contract with Jim. And so Jim says, we ain't had no contract for no $60,000. And Bob says, yes, we did. Mm-hmm, yes, some sir. And Jim says, you out of your m mind. And Bob says, hey, Jim, I ain't too much out of my mind because I know you told me it was okay. Yeah, I said it was okay. I didn't say it was okay for no $60,000. Oh, yes, you did. That was my price. You knew what my price was because I done told you about my prices. Said, but you didn't tell me about your price in that particular situation. Yeah, but you had prior knowledge. Ladies and gentlemen, if they go to court, Jim loses. Why? Because Jim agreed. Wait a minute. Jim didn't sign anything. Jim didn't need to sign anything. The law requires that there be an established relationship between the parties. And that the parties have an obligation to each other and that there be value and consideration. So let's go ahead and see if the parties had a relationship. Jim and Bob knew each other. Jim and Bob had spoken to each other about the particular task. What was the value? Well, the value was the bricks. What was the consideration? Well, Bob moved the bricks for Jim, and Jim said it was fine for Bob to do so. But that's not so much a unilateral contract as it is a contract, right? Yes, exactly. However, the amount of cost for moving it was the unilateral part. You see, as Bob said, Jim had knowledge of his prices and how much he charged and how much he valued his services. Well, let's give you another unilateral situation. 
There was this thing called the Age of Majority. Ever heard of it? Well, the governments have what's called sovereign guardianship over all of the people in their nation. And because of that, well, let's show you something. We're going to pause y'all and we're going to get back with Al Green in just a second. So y'all hold on. Ladies and gentlemen, from the 1948 era is this cartoon. I want you to pay attention. This is one of a series of films produced by the Extension Department of Harding College to create a deeper understanding of what has made America the finest place to live in the world. Make mine freedom. I want freedom. Can y'all handle it? Let's go ahead and play the whole thing. Now hold on, we gonna pause it first. And what we gonna do, I said pause. See, it don't wanna listen. All right, we got our pause going on, and now I'm going, Isley Brothers, y'all hold on a second. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, 48, 48 years ago, well, I mean 1948, not 48 years ago, over 60 years ago. To Grandpa, it's the front porch in the cool of the evening. <laughs> to Mother and her family, it's church on Sunday morning. And to Dad, it's his favorite relaxation. Tiger Woods in his young years. It's the Cracker Barrel philosophers in Fab Tree Corners. And it's the tycoons in Wall Street. It's all races, creeds, and religions. It's freedom to work at the job you like. Freedom of speech and to peaceably assemble. Freedom to own property. Security from unlawful search or seizure. What you want, Flatfoot? The right to a speedy and public trial. Protection against cruel punishments and excessive fines. The right to vote and to worship God in your own way. It is these freedoms that have made America strong. Okay, okay, so we got our freedom. But management's lost it up everything. Labor is at fault. It's ruining the country. My constituents, as your elected representative, I can assure you labor's right. Management's right. I'm strictly neutral. Labor? Management, Ladies and politicians, gentlemen, oh, they can't tell corn from oats. Right. If you can tell, they had it right in 1948. Politicians take both sides. That's why they flip flop. And that's why you'll hear them saying things about flip flop. Labor is right. Management is right. And, you know, I'm neutral. I'm here as a negotiator. I'm like an arbitrator. So let's continue. Right up, folks. Here's the answer to your problems. Dr. Utopia's sensational new discovery isn't. Now, this also lets you know that I'm before my time because I was telling everybody about this wonderful little acronym, not acronym, but um, syllable, ism. Ism, signifying belief, signifying idealism see ism it's religion he's selling religion now he's not saying he's selling religion i want you to pay attention to what he's selling ism will cure any ailment of the body politic it's terrific it's tremendous once you swallow the contents of this bottle you'll have the bountiful benefit of higher wages shorter hours and security Enormous profits, no strikes. Remember, you're the big boss. Government control, no worry about votes. Name your own salary. Bigger crops, lower costs. He's got an ism for everything. Everything that ails you. Every single time he shows them a bottle, it is exactly for their needs. Huh. Sounds like religion to me, huh? Now, there's a difference between, because they talked about it, if you paid attention to the video, he says, the freedom to serve God how you want. There was never a freedom to serve God how you want. 
You cannot serve a God the way you want to serve him. You have to serve a God because he is a sovereign being, a superior being, the way he wants you to serve him. But shh, people are not paying attention to the words. They're just watching the cartoon to see that it talks about the stuff that's going on today and what's really going on behind the scenes. And they're not watching the symbolism, ism, symbolism. That's the whole purpose of the video. It's all symbolism. Ism. Continue. Why, ism even makes the weather perfect every day. And now then, because we are introducing this amazing item for the first time in this country, it isn't going to cost you one cent. All you have to do is sign this little scrap of paper and you get your bottle absolutely free. It's a contract folks all you have to do is sign on the dotted line or agree via acquiescence anybody ever heard of the new deal well he's about to make them a new deal i hereby turn over to ism incorporated everything i have including my freedom and the freedom of my children and my children's children in return for which said ism promises to take care of me forever now if you are not paying attention, you will miss the point. So let me explain this to you. It says, I hereby turn over to ISM Incorporated. So let's take ISM out of the way and let's put United States Incorporated. Remember, this is 1948. Everything I have, including my freedom, and the freedom of my children and my children's children in return for which ism promises to take care of me and take care of all of my needs. Is that not what happened in 1933? Again, people are watching this video and not seeing how, and this was done by a college. The government was letting them know everything that was going on. I want you to pay attention. And everybody was willing to give up all of their property, their gold, everything. Excuse me. me. And who are you, my good man? This is John. I'm John Q. Public. Ah, oh, my fine friend, you're just in time to share this generous and gigantic offer. Sign right here. Mm. Mind if I read it first? Hurry up! Oh, yeah. oh, that's what it is. Isn't that like the public? Everybody's so willing to get a benefit because somebody said it's a benefit and they just because it's a benefit because people are greedy people man the moment you tell them here you go and, and I'm gonna stop talking about this video for a second because I didn't initially do the video to talk about this I initially did the video to talk about the fact that there are gonna be people out there who are gonna say negative things about me well you say negative things about other people no I say negative things about the way people do things there's not a single person on the internet who knows me there's not a single person out there who can come and tell you anything about me, negative or otherwise. There can't be a single person who's had a negative experience in dealing with me other than the fact that either they tried to get over, they lied to me, and I can't stand that, or they tried to take advantage of me and I would not allow it. Okay, those are the issues that anybody or their grandfather would have. But not a single person is going to tell you that I took anything from them, that I swindled them, that I did not keep my word. Whew. I wish they would. But there's going to be negative, negative, negative. Why? Because there's an institution out there that wants that to be the case. And we'll explain more about that when we talk about the contract at the end after this video here. So shall we finish talking about how they are so eager to sign on to this agreement? Many of them are going to be doing it by silent acquiescence because remember, children's children. Well, first of all, I cannot sell your rights and you're my child or my grandchild or my great grandchild or my great 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 grandchild. But if you go to the scriptures, you'll see when Joseph had his two sons, Manasseh, and Ephraim, Jacob told him as he had those two children brought to him just before his passing, he says, these are my children and their children will become your children. 
So this is where they're getting that and his, your children's children, okay? Because of the way things were done in the past, the progeny were that of the so-called, uh, what do you call those people? See, I cannot even think of the name of it where it's a P word for somebody, patriarch. The patriarchal society is where that's coming from. Let's continue with this, please. Keep your shirts on, boys. You know, including my freedom. Freedom? Well, sign away my freedom. Why, this is ridiculous. Ladies and gentlemen, the very first thing the document says is that the person was signing over their freedom. But because it said it first, nobody paid attention to it. They only paid attention to the benefit part because that's what it said last. And that's how contracts usually work. You see, people usually skip over what's at the beginning because it's at the beginning. No, they usually tend to pay attention to what's at the end of the document, which pay attention to our document. The very first beginning of the document says that, hey, by receiving this, you blah, 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 blee, blah, 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 blee, blah, blah. And then the arbitration clause. Everything is right there the way it's supposed to be. Same thing they do to us, we do to them. Don't be corny, brother. <laughs> sure, our system of free enterprise isn't perfect. But before we throw it away for some imported double talk, let's turn the clock back a few years to see what it's done for us. For example, back... Hold on. I'm not interested in this part. This is not the part that we need to be focused on. We don't need to be focused on that either or that. That's that enterprise stuff. And it ain't talking about the car rental company either. Let's go here. Yeah, because this is... Yeah, we can live with this. Any other sex nation in the world with only 7% of the Earth's... We drive 70% of the world's automobiles. That's just a sample of the things the capitalistic system has given us in only 160 years. Before signing up, you boys ought to try a little taste of Doctorism's formula to see what you get in exchange for your freedom. Go ahead, try it. The Union. Welcome to our ranks, number 1313. I'll take this case to the Supreme Court. The state is the Supreme Court. Our decision is as follows. Did, did you see that? The state is the Supreme Court. The state is the clamp on freedoms. That's what the laws are for. I'm sorry, statutes. <laughs> Got to get that straight. That's what the statutes are for. The statutes take away one freedom or another or another, but it makes you think you're receiving a benefit because it makes you believe you're receiving a benefit. Okay. Hello. No more private property. No more you. No more private property. All property is in the state by virtue of government. No more you. No, you are now a legal person. Let's see if they talk about this in this video. Well, the farm voter put a stop to this. Farmers don't vote anymore. Well, what will I do for seed next year? You won't have to worry about next year. The state will do your planning from now on. to regain our freedom or everything is lost everything everything is fine 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 when anybody preaches disunity tries to pit one of us against the other through class warfare race hatred or religious intolerance you know that person seeks to rob us of our freedom 
and destroy our very lives. And Ladies and gentlemen, the rest of it is just uh, corny. But let's make sure you all understand what's going on. This is exactly what's happened in our society. And people didn't even see it. Why? Because they were so interested in these benefits. What's in it for me? The me-ism. Again, another religious-based system. Ism. That's what that video was about. But you would not have gotten it if it had not been pointed out to you, step by step, what they were talking about. See, that's my ability. I can see things. I see dead people, mama! Okay, but what I see is what the next person would not see. That's why, watching videos, I see the subtlety. Now, I may not be able to spot the advertisement in movies, you know, the prop that is placed in a certain position at every single moment while I'm watching that movie or television show or commercial. Well, I don't watch commercials. And the reason why most of the time I can see the advertisement in movies is because you can see the way something is positioned. The name of the company is pointed right at the camera. See, if it were me, I would point the name of the company, the advertisement, I would put it not so subtle because the brain picks up everything. I would have the name, if it's a Coca-Cola advertisement, I would turn Coca-Cola slightly to the left in one scene and slightly to the right so that it will appeal to the people both on the right and the left. You see what I'm saying? But they don't do advertisement that way. They throw it right in front of your face and they keep showing it to you over and over and over again. Well, enough about that. Ladies and gentlemen, the process is illusion and distraction. And so while he is offering these individuals this opportunity, what does he offer them? I'll give you this for free. You won't have to pay a dime. No, all you have to do is sign on the dotted line and we'll defer the cost till later. Ladies and gentlemen, this is how government works. Government throws a lot of stuff at you, making you seem like you're receiving a benefit. Let me give you one of those benefits that companies are doing to people every single day and they're not seeing it. Right now, a product will cost someone uh, maybe $3. And then last year, the same product cost the person $3.15. But now it's only $3. What happens? Did they reduce their price by $3? No. Well, what's going on? You're getting less. What do you mean I'm getting less? The box is still the same size. No, it actually isn't. The box is actually several centimeters smaller than it was previously. Well, no, it looks like the same size. It's almost the same height. Yes, almost the same height. However, look at the ounces. Look at the weight. Oh, yeah, last year it was 26.4 ounces. Now it's 22.3 ounces. That's right. And... Notice how the year before, and the year before, and the year before, and how much the ounces keep dwindling away so that you are getting less, but it appears that box looks like it's still the same size, that package looks like it's still the same size, but it's not, and the weight is different. And it looks like you're getting the same thing, just a little bit less, Ladies and gentlemen, you're getting a lot less. And because it's roughly about the same price, that's inflation. But that's the illusionary inflation. Why? Because the illusion is you're getting the same thing you were getting, so you're getting the same value. And you're not. And you're accepting this. Why? Because you will buy that junk and support that company. It's okay. Because if you don't support them, then you'll have to support the other company who is giving you more, but their price is 80% higher. Why is it 80% higher? Well, the reason why it's 80% higher, because that's the true value of the product. So let's get back to this contract thing, because it's all about contract, ladies and gentlemen. You agree to all of this through acquiescence. You receive notification. You cannot you cannot say for a second that you did not know. He didn't know. He didn't know. Sorry. You cannot say 
that you did not know. That was Tony Braxton, I believe, did that song. Anyway, you knew. Well, we have a relationship with government because of the Proclamation 2039. They offered us ism, and we accepted ism. It was a cure-all. There was a national crisis, a serious emergency, and so they gave us a cure-all. What was the cure-all? It was the New Deal, and they gave us a salesman. A salesman, yes, his name was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. That was the guy selling them isms, people. They offered a New Deal, and the people didn't have to do anything at the time other than give up their gold. They were going to replace it. They just needed the gold because they needed to take care of their debt. And the people did it. But not everybody had gold. It's okay. Don't worry about it. If you don't have any gold, we're still going to give you access to this new currency. There was, cur there was no currency before that. Go back before 1929 and look and see that there was no so-called currency because the dollars were backed by gold. That was not the current. That was not the electricity that kept the system going. Gold was the currency. Silver was the currency. Dollar bills were not. But right now, what is the dollar bills backed by? Well, the United States Treasury says they're backed by nothing. He says, but in the market, they're backed by a commodity. Because did they not tell you in that video that this is a commercial-based system? Yes, they're backed by the commodities for what you can buy. But in a debt-based system, you can't buy anything. That's why dollar bills, according to the Treasury, are worthless. Because you can't buy anything with them. So they are worthless. They are only good for what they can buy. They tell you that right on their site. You just have to take the time to not not focus on the word. You don't have to focus on every word. Everybody wants to look up the legal definition for this and the legal definition for that. This is not about legal definition. This is about the way words are phrased together. Okay? When they said that the dollars have no value for themselves, the treasury wasn't lying to you. When it says they are backed by nothing, the treasury wasn't lying to you. They are backed by nothing because what they're backed by has no value. But that's okay. All right. So we have an agreement with the United States. We have a relationship with the United States. Well, unilateral, require, uh, unilateral contracts require that the parties have a relationship. Now, unilateral contracts also require that the parties are obligated to communicate with one another. Well, they're obligated to communicate with us. That is the requirement. Unilateral contract. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, with a unilateral contract... There must be value. There must be consideration. Well, the unilateral contract, the value is our labor. The value is our giving up a right or a freedom. That's the value. What's the consideration? Well, the United States says, hey, they're going to take care of all our needs. That's why they own all of our property, the ownership of all properties in the state. The money will be created. What's the money? Pay attention. The money is not dollar bills. Go back and read the law. Figure out what money is. I had one person write me and say, you know, they figured it out. But no, go in, figure out, see if you can figure out what the money is that is backed by the credit of the nation. What's the credit of the nation? Is not the credit of the nation the people? Don't take my word for it. All right, so now we have value consideration. Now, there must be, again, an obligation of the parties one to the other. Well, the United States has made a promise, and the people have made a promise, so they have an obligation to each other. Ah, but guess what they continue to do? They continue to change the terms of the contract. Now, do you know that you have the right to accept or reject their change in terms of the contract by doing a conditional acceptance and offer? And so... That's what the contracts do. A conditional acceptance and offer. Well, what makes them obligated? Well, nothing. Until they fail to take care of the provisions 
such as responding to the questions within 10 days, well, they, how can they be obligated? Well, the reason why they're obligated is because you have a prior relationship. And a unilateral contract is binding on all parties. The unilateral contract must have fairness. So you must be obligated, they must be obligated equally. You do have an obligation. The contract says that you will carry out everything. You will pay whatever it is you're supposed to pay. They just have to answer your questions. So it is a fair obligation. There is value, there is consideration. There is property. It has an expiration date. And it is not undoable. So it's not an impossibility. They, the other party is fully capable of carrying out what it is they're supposed to carry out, i.e. unilateral contract. Well, how is a unilateral contract binding on government? Well, it's not. But because the unilateral contract involves commerce, then they're no longer government when you're dealing with them. They waive their right upon receipt and acquiescence. And now the Federal Arbitration Act comes into play because it deals with all matters that involve arbitration and commerce. Well, because your matter has a arbitration clause, the Commerce Clause comes into play, which means Congress could regulate. Well, how did Congress regulate contracts with arbitration clause? The Federal Arbitration Act. Well, the Supreme Court has just stated that the, pay attention, The Supreme Court rules that arbitration must be determined by an arbitrator when the contract provides for arbitration. I know arbitrability, but ladies and gentlemen, the Supreme Court said if the contract says that the parties are going to arbitrate any question associated with arbitration and that it has an arbitration clause, the Federal Arbitration Act comes into play. Now. What I want to let you know, because there is a, we, we have to show this to you because most people are not going to get this either, and I'm, I'm sorry, but let's see if we can go to the actual Supreme Court.gov. Now, this is the administrative Supreme Court, okay, but let's see if we can get you guys to understand what the Supreme Court was really saying in this lawsuit. I'm doing a word search. The word search I'm doing, it's pulling up the document now. The document is not that big, but because it's PDF, the document is big. Okay, pay attention. The act does not contain a wholly groundless exception and we are not at liberty to rewrite the statute passed by Congress and signed by the president. Do you know why the Supreme Court said they are powerless concerning that statute? The Federal Arbitration Act, that's the statute they're talking about. Do you know why they say that we are not at liberty? We don't have the freedom, because that's what liberty means, to rewrite or change the statute that was passed by Congress and signed by the president. Well, the United States has what's known as a three-party government. You have the executive branch, the president, the legislative branch, Congress, and the judicial branch, the Supreme Court, who is here saying we. Well, the we has no power because the they, Congress and the president, two members of the three parties, make up what's called a two-thirds majority. The Supreme Court have no jurisdiction because two-thirds majority. The same thing with Proclamation 2039, the president signing off on it, and pay attention, the March 9, 1933 Act. That's your two-thirds majority. The Supreme Court had no authority to come in and say anything. That's what the court is saying. This, this is their words. This is the actual decision by the court. They said, we are not at liberty to rewrite the statute passed by Congress and signed by the president. I want you all to understand that. Who brought up anything about them changing the statute? Well, they did because the courts were coming up with this wholly groundless exception. 
So that's why they're saying the act does not contain a holy groundless exception. Nothing in the language or the wording says anything about holy groundless, holy exception. Ladies and gentlemen, that's why Congress was trying to change who has access to arbitration. That's why they're trying to amend the act. Because they want to stop you from doing exactly what you hear us saying you can do. Now, let's go to the second part where they talk about the president to let you see this is exactly what the Supreme Court is talking about. In 1925, Congress passed and President Coolidge signed the Federal Arbitration Act. You see, that's all that matters. They mentioned they could just say Congress passed it. But they're highlighting that Coolidge signed it. Why are they highlighting that Coolidge signed the act as president of the United States? Well, the reason why they're highlighting that he signed it, because they're showing you that's a two-thirds majority. And here they're validating it. That's why all of their other cases validating it. Now, what does the act say at number two? Written provisions to a contract evidencing a transaction involving commerce to be settled by arbitration, a controversy thereafter arising out of such contract shall be valid, irrevocable, enforceable, saved upon the grounds that exist in law and in equity for the revocation of contract. Well, we just talked about what is required in a contract. Okay, here is the thing. Only the arbitrator can determine whether or not the contract is valid. Under the Act, arbitration is a matter of contract and the courts must enforce arbitration contracts according to their terms. They don't pay attention. The courts do not get to tell you whether or not your contract is valid, whether or not the arbitration is valid. Do you not understand how this case right here solidified everything for us? Because they just said as long as our contracts are fair, as long as our contracts are reasonable, as long as our contracts include an arbitration clause, as long as our contracts is value, has value, has consideration, as long as the parties have a relationship or a duty to each other, as long as it has an exploration, expiration date, and as long as the contract is does not require somebody to do the impossible, then it's not invalid under revocation. They cannot revoke it because it violates existing law and equity, because this is contract law, and it deals specifically with the contract clause. This is why that document we received from the court where the court wanted to talk about dismissing a case that we asked for arbitration. This court has said in several cases, once a party asks for arbitration, the courts are powerless. They must grant the arbitration. Well, that court doesn't think we know that. And so now we need to let them know. Here again, even when the parties contract delegate the threshold arbitrability question to an arbitrator, the Fifth Circuit and other circuit courts of appeals have determined that the court rather than the arbitrator gets to decide the threshold arbitrability question. Under the contract, the argument for arbitration is wholly groundless, then the courts can say, hey, it's wholly groundless. Well, they're saying, no, they can't do that anymore. This is what they were doing. So, at descendant agreements, the party seeking arbitration asked the federal courts to enforce and FAA operates on this additional arbitration agreement just as it does as any other. The Supreme Court said this in a Renner Center case that as long as the arbitration agreement says this or says that, the federal courts have to enforce that agreement. So when you go for your motion for um, confirmation of arbitration award, the courts can't ignore that. They have to issue the award. We must interpret the act as written, and the act in turn requires that we interpret, interpret the contract as written. Well, what does the contract say? It's, you got you got to thank Congress when they wrote that act because they were doing it for corporations. They weren't realizing that there was somebody out there like me or Mr. Bradley Christopher Stark. When the party's contract delegates the arbitrability question to an arbitrator, the courts may not 
override that contract. Ladies and gentlemen, that's why I say the Supreme Court could not have done us greater justice, but I want you to pay attention because nobody wants to pay attention to this. Everybody wants to ignore this. I told you that my God is the one who I go to. I could not have gotten this information if it not were not for him. So pay attention. Before the Supreme Court even came to this conclusion, what were we doing? Arbitration. And then they came to this conclusion in January the 8th? They talked about a resetting of the system. They knew that somebody would be doing exactly what we're doing. At first, I said they didn't know about our organization. They did not know what we were doing, but the Supreme Court knew exactly what we were doing. They knew somebody would do this. They knew this would be figured out by someone. They knew this. And guess what? There is nothing they can do. They cannot override what we're doing. Pay attention. When a parties to a contract delegate the arbitrability question to an arbitrator, Mr. Bradley Christopher Stark had already included that in his arbitration agreement. He already included that. The court may not override that contract. In those circumstances, the, a court possesses no power to decide the arbitrability issue. That is true even if the court thinks the argument um, thinks that the argument that the arbitration agreement applies to a particular dispute is wholly groundless. It says it doesn't matter what the court thinks is what they're saying. Ladies and gentlemen, that's why I told you I'm not worried about what a court says or what a court thinks. They say, well, you can't do an arbitration in a criminal matter. Who says you can't? Do they not do plea agreements in criminal matters all the time? Well, plea agreements are civil. They're not criminal. So who says you can't do an arbitration in a criminal matter? Mr. Bradley Christopher Stark did. Interesting, ain't it? And the United States government agrees. Then the court tried to say... Uh, and we've already ruled this and we've already ruled that. Well, it doesn't matter what you rule. The parties agreed to this. The Supreme Court has just said it does not matter what you think. It ain't got nothing to do with you. So, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to take these two paragraphs, study them, understand them. This is from the Supreme Court case. This is the actual conversation in the Supreme Court. I want you to go over these two paragraphs. And how can I point out these two paragraphs to you? Because I want you to pay attention to what they said. That conclusion follows not only from the text of the act, but also from precedent. We have held that a court may not rule on the potential merits of an underlying claim that is assigned by contract to an arbitrator, even if it appears to the court to be frivolous. So the court cannot tell you like they tried to tell us that our stuff was frivolous. It says it can't do it. And they've known this since 1986. The court has no business weighing the merits of the grievance because the agreement is to submit all grievances to the arbitrator, not merely those which the court deems are meritous. Okay? Ladies and gentlemen, they've known this since 1960. Why? Because the Arbitration Act has not changed. The Arbitration Act has not changed. So when you get an opportunity, don't worry about the holy groundless exception because this ain't got nothing to do with that. When you get an opportunity, copy these two sentences. I mean, these two paragraphs. Focus on these two, because this lets you know how powerful your contracts are. This lets you know how this man is ahead of his time. This lets you know that nobody was doing this and applying this to arbitration and uh, mortgages and all of that. Remember, they had the courts and they were utilizing the court and they came up with this call, this so-called non-judicial foreclosure. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're participating in a non-judicial foreclosure with the Federal Arbitration Act. We've added arbitration to our non-judicial foreclosure. And the Supreme Court has said that the courts have no say-so, i.e. non-judicial. I'd rather have it decided by an arbitrator, according to the terms of the contract, i.e. arbitration agreement. 
Some of you are going to get this. Some of you are going to understand this. But I took the time to explain it. So I'm going to go mind my business. The website will be finished in two days. Sorry that it's taking so long. But it, like I said, it's gigabytes. And not a person who has a WordPress site. Man, a WordPress site is a couple of hundred megabytes. So that can be done liggity split. I mean, literally seconds. But because our site is so encumbensome, and it has over 40 gigabytes, I'm told 56 gigabytes in total. That's the problem. The gig, the gigabytes. All right, you see how I kept Al Green and the Isley Brothers and everything off while I explained this? So don't y'all dare say, he didn't give us any time to understand. Okay? This is what's going on, people. All of that other stuff that you got going on, all of that other stuff is a distraction. The only way you can understand this, these two paragraphs, is you have to get rid of all that other junk in your head. You have to get rid of that doubt because they have taught you to doubt everything. They've taught you to doubt yourself. They taught you to doubt me. They taught you to doubt the law. I don't want you to believe in me. Believe in me. I don't want you to give in to me. I don't want any of that. I want you to focus on on the fact that you are required to know the law and ignorance of the law is no excuse so understand these foundational principles because this everything here is based on the foundational principles of the arbitration act and how that act is binding on congress the united states executive branch and the united states supreme court that's what the supreme court is saying here that's why they're saying we cannot rewrite the law Yes, I know you all want to change it. That's what the Supreme Court is telling the court. Yes, I know you all want to change it because you see what's coming. That's what they were telling them. You see what's coming. Why this case? Why now? Why would the Supreme Court make a decision like this right now and word it the way they worded it? You remember, they are like Congress. They don't write an opinion or a decision that they have not worked out every single phrase. That's why I say you need to understand. You need to understand. They came to a fact. This law right here is a fact. Then they came to a, where's my mouse? Conclusion. The court operates on facts and conclusions of law. Here is the fact. We must interpret the act as written. That is a fact. They cannot get around that. Second. We conclude, so this is the fact and this is the conclusion. Rely on this. And if you gotta go to the appeals court, rely on this. Stop explaining everything. I wrote uh, uh, something back to the appeals court and now I gotta go take a lot of stuff out because that's, I'm in the same habit as the rest of y'all. I was explaining a lot of stuff. I ain't explained nothing to these mother, nigga, mother, you gonna follow the law. So, Ladies and gentlemen, I told you, you must understand this statement right here. You must find your square and stand on it and don't be moved from your square. They will threaten, they will try, they will try to put on all these parlor tricks. Stick to your contract. Your contract is the law. That's what the Supreme Court said. You, oh God, ladies and gentlemen, I didn't say it. The Supreme Court said it. It says... Pay attention. We have held that a court may not rule on the potential merits of an underlying claim that is assigned by contract to an arbitrator, even if it appears to the court to be frivolous. Okay? The court has no business weighing the merits of the grievance because the agreement is to submit all grievable or grievances to arbitration. Not merely those which the court deems are meritorious, okay, or meritorious. Ladies and gentlemen, understand something. The court has no say. It doesn't matter what the court thinks, okay? It, that is true even if the court thinks that the argument, so it doesn't matter what the court thinks, what the judicial officer thinks. All right, under 50 minutes. Have a good day. Good.